In a very different situation, even employers who have no animosity or aversions against particular groups may nevertheless engage in discrimination 1b, empirically based generalizations, when the employer knows that various groups react differently in the presence of some other group or groups. Back in 19th century America, for example, when there were many immigrants from Europe in the workforce, some groups brought their mutual antagonisms in Europe with them to America. To have a workforce including both Irish Protestants and Irish Catholics working together at that time was to risk distracting frictions and even violence with negative effects on productivity. In other words, a workforce consisting exclusively of either group might be more efficient than a workforce consisting of both. The same principle applies where different groups have especially positive reactions to one another. For example, the employer may be indifferent as to whether the work to be done is done by men or by women, and yet be well aware that men and women are not indifferent to each other, or else the human race would have become extinct long ago. Therefore, in the interests of workforce efficiency, when a particular occupation is overwhelmingly chosen by women, such as nursing, the employer may be reluctant to hire a male nurse, regardless of that male nurse's individual qualifications. Conversely, where lumberjacks are overwhelmingly male, the employer may be reluctant to hire a female lumberjack, even if she is demonstrably as fully qualified as the man. Observers who point out that particular individuals are equally qualified, regardless of sex, miss the point. An equally qualified individual may do the work just as well as others, but if some of the others are distracted from their work, the net effect can be a less efficient workforce. That is the empirical basis that can lead employers to practice discrimination 1b in such situations, even if the employers have no bias or aversion to those less likely to be hired. Misdiagnosing the basis for discrimination produces more than a difference in words. It can produce policies less likely to achieve their goals, or even policies that make matters worse, as in the case of forbidding employers from checking criminal records of job applicants. Moreover, higher costs are not just a problem limited to employers. Others are going to have to pay the higher costs that initially fall on employers, if those employers are to stay in business and continue to provide jobs. Many people do not like to hear economists say that there is no free lunch, but that does not change the reality. Employment decisions are not the only decisions affected by discrimination of one sort or another. Where there are real differences between groups with potentially dire consequences, such as murder rates several times higher in one group than in another, Discrimination 1b may be carried to the point of redlining a whole neighborhood or group, even when a majority of the group avoided are not guilty of the behavior feared. Even in a high-crime neighborhood, for example, most people are not necessarily criminals. As a personal note, some years ago, an elderly relative was crossing a busy thoroughfare alone in the Bronx when she lost consciousness and fell to the ground in a high-crime neighborhood. People on the sidewalk rushed out into the street to direct traffic around her. One of the women in the group took charge of her purse and returned it after my unconscious relative revived. Not a cent was missing from the purse. But the costs of sorting the local population individually can be prohibitively high. Therefore, decisions are likely to be made through a cruder decision-making process relying on empirically based generalizations, discrimination 1b, rather than the more discerning but costly discrimination 1a, or an antipathy-based or bias-based discrimination 2. One of the consequences of such situations is that a law-abiding majority in a high-crime neighborhood can end up paying a high price for the presence of a criminal minority living in their midst. Some businesses will not deliver their products, whether pizzas or furniture, to high-crime neighborhoods, rather than risk bodily harm, including death, to their drivers. Taxi drivers may avoid taking passengers to such neighborhoods for the same reason, even when these are black taxi drivers refusing to go into black high-crime neighborhoods, especially at night. Supermarket chains and other businesses 
often avoid locating local stores in such neighborhoods for similar reasons. All this hurts law-abiding people in high-crime neighborhoods who are, in effect, paying a price for what other people are doing. In addition to being the principal victims of criminals in their midst, they also literally pay a price in hard cash for the behavior of others, in the higher prices usually charged for goods sold in neighborhoods where there are higher costs of doing business, due to higher levels of shoplifting, vandalism, burglary, pilferage, and robbery, and higher business insurance premiums because of these and other neighborhood disorders. A study titled The Poor Pay More saw the poor in general as exploited consumers taken advantage of by stores located in low-income neighborhoods. This view was echoed in the media, in government, and in academic publications. Yet, because many low-income neighborhoods are also high-crime neighborhoods, the poor pay more committed an all-too-common error in assuming that the cause of some undesirable outcome can be determined by where the statistical data were collected. In this case, researchers collected price data in the neighborhood stores, but the causes of those high prices were not the people who posted those prices in the stores. Moreover, while prices were higher in inner-city, low-income neighborhood stores, rates of profit on investments in such stores were not higher than average, but lower than average, despite some people who assumed that profit rates had to be higher because of the higher prices. For people unaware of the economics of the situation, the higher prices may be seen as simply price gouging by greedy store owners discrimination, too, against minority neighborhoods, and a problem that the government could solve by imposing price controls, for example, as a Harlem newspaper suggested during the 1960s furor over revelations that the poor pay more. If, however, businesses in these neighborhoods do not recover their higher costs of doing business there in the prices they charge, they face the prospect of being forced out of business by losses. There is often a dearth of businesses in low-income, high-crime neighborhoods, which would hardly be the case if there were higher rates of profit being made from the higher prices charged in such neighborhoods. It may be no consolation to those law-abiding citizens in a high-crime neighborhood that the higher prices they have to pay are reimbursing higher costs of doing business where they live. Meanwhile, politicians and local activists have every incentive to claim that the higher prices are due to discrimination, in the sense of discrimination too, even when in fact the community is simply paying additional costs generated by some residents in that community. Those local residents who created none of those costs may be victims of those who did, rather than being victims of those who charged the resulting higher prices. This is not just an abstract philosophical point or a matter of semantics. The difference between understanding the source of the higher prices and mistakenly blaming those who charged those prices, which is especially likely when most of the local businesses are owned by people who are ethnically different from the people living in the neighborhood, is the difference between doing things to lessen the problem and doing things likely to make the problem worse by driving more much-needed businesses out of the neighborhood. Although higher prices in low-income neighborhoods are often discussed in the context of racial or ethnic minorities, the same economic consequences have been found where the people in the low-income neighborhoods are white. As the Cincinnati Enquirer reported, residents of eastern Kentucky refer to the higher prices and interest rates common in their area as the hillbilly tax. Among the things that might be done to reduce the burden of unfairness to law-abiding residents of high-crime neighborhoods could be stronger law enforcement by the police and the courts. But to the extent that the public, both inside and outside the affected communities, sees the high prices as discrimination too against the affected community as a whole, due to bias or antipathy by the larger society, the imposition of stronger law enforcement could be seen as just another imposition of injustice on the affected communities. In short, whether people believe that higher prices in low-income, high-crime neighborhoods are due to discrimination too, 
or to empirically based decisions, discrimination 1, matters in terms of which policies to reduce the unfair burdens on law-abiding residents are politically feasible. Community or ethnic solidarity can be a major obstacle to seeing, believing, or responding to the facts.